a proper introduction tonight before the reading. So I will just say um, that Mr. O'Brien is the author of many books, including um, The Things They Carried, Going After Cacciato, July July, Tomcat in Love, and others. Um, these are books about love and silence and friendship and childhood and war and memory and mistakes and happiness and also about storytelling, about writing. Um, this is a room full of aspiring writers um, and this will be in a question and answer format. So I thought that I would ask the first question and then we'll open it up to all of you. Um, so for my first question, I wonder if you could tell us um, a little bit about how you got started as a writer. Um, I got started, well I didn't write, I got started wanting to write. And uh, as much as Vietnam was important to me, my hometown and family were at least as important. And I can remember um, an image of my dad uh, sitting in, a, in an easy chair around this time of year, you know, sort of late November, early December in there, and it was getting dark outside. And there was a lamp on behind him, and he was reading a book, and I remember looking my dad reading that book and he had a he had an expression of contentment and delight and for the even a kind of rapture or whatever. whatever he was reading I could tell he really loved it and I remember thinking to myself as a seven-year-old or eight-year-old kid how much I wished I were that book <laughs> so that my dad would look at me the way he was looking at that book with unreserved, unqualified uh, happiness. And I think that, that memory of my dad was the, the first stirring of wanting to write. Pretty sure it was. Vietnam was important, and my hometown was important, and girlfriends, and all kinds of other things, but. Uh, and it, it's so easy to overestimate something big like a war, say, well, that's all it was. But of course, if you think about it, the, the Joseph Hallers and the Vonnegut's and the Norman Mailers and the Stephen Cranes all came out of childhood and with all these, and through adolescence and into adulthood, picking up baggage along the way. They did, just didn't go into a war naked and come out of it a warrior or a veteran. You, you, you're you made a writer by the life you lead. Thank you. Um, should we move out to one of you? Any questions? I have several of them. <laughs> um, well, you mentioned a few writers just now. Maybe I could ask. Um, are those some of your favorite writers? I, I think so many people read and reread all of your books, and I'm curious about who you read and reread. I just finished a book a couple of hours ago that I had never heard of until I went on my Kindle and just looked for a book to read. I started it on the flight here, and I finished it you know, like an hour or two ago. It was amazing. It was about a woman who has lost her memory. It's called as uh, Before I Go to Sleep is the title of it. It's an, Eng an English woman who wrote this book. It's a story of a woman who's lost her memory. And so every day when she wakes up, she doesn't know who she is, who the people around her are. She doesn't know anything about her background. Am I married? Am I whatever? Then every day she has to recover through the, through the man who is her husband, at least so we think, when the book opens. Uh, it turns out otherwise. But she <laughs> tells her that she, he's her husband. She learns things in the course of the day about her life, and then she goes to sleep and forgets it all again. So every day she's rediscovering herself, and she begins writing a journal as a way of in, to, to, to replace memory. She has a journal that she hides in a closet, and she adds to it and adds to it and adds to it and adds to it. And that's, that's her memory inside this shoebox in a closet. Um, it's, it's an astonishing book, it's, uh, and I got to the end, and I read the acknowledgments, and one of the acknowledgments is to 
a woman I know <laughs> whose uh, husband had uh, suffered, had gotten a virus that's her, basically it's herpes, herpes simplex, that virus you know they get cold sores from. Mm -hmm. And now and then it will awaken, not in your lips or elsewhere, but in your spinal area, and then it'll travel right to your brain. That's what happened to this guy. His name was Clive Waring. He was a musician, a composer in England. And uh, it was so moving to have read a book, I really, I can't say it was a perfect book. It, it kind of turned into a thriller at the end. It kind of took a, as if the author didn't entirely trust what was just a really a good story in its own right, about memory and what is memory? Who are we if we don't have memories? What are we? Are we, are we people or chipmunks? <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> And if every day you awaken without memory as to what you are and who you are and what you love and what you don't love and what you aspire to. Uh, anyway, that's an example of, of the sorts of things that I, I read eclectically. I don't read, you know, read all of Nabokov and then read all of, you know, Faulkner. I read books that come to my attention from whatever source it may be. And there's a, a scatter them. I'm a little bit like the woman in the story that I, I usually, if I hadn't just finished this book, I wouldn't remember the title. And even now, I only remember the author's last name, which is Watson, and that'll probably be gone tomorrow. But I will remember the story. That I know I'll remember, because it's chilling and important and, and compelling to read. And those are the books that, that, uh, that appeal to me. Um, are there any stories that you go back to to remember to kind of give yourself a context or get yourself in a certain mood when you're writing? If you want to feel sad, do you uh, recant something or you know start thinking about something mm -hmm. specifically? <clears throat> no, I don't. I, if I do, I don't know I'm doing it. I might, but I don't. I'm not aware of doing it. Ordinarily, when I it takes me a long time to write even a short story. It probably would five months on average or eight months, long time. And to write a novel was five to seven years. So I'm ordinarily a, on a project and I don't have to every day invent something new, say to put myself in a sad mood. The story may have gone there, may go, go into something comic for a while anyway. But I'm in the story um, when I return to the typewriter every day. And I'll read it over and find out where I what's happening and then spend an hour or two kind of fidgeting, <laughs> my body moving and trying to just kind of enter a fantasy state where you can begin the characters, begin to, the, 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 the urgency that I'd felt the day before about a character situation gets reawakened in me. And then I begin following the daydream of a story. I'm not I'm not mystical about it, I'm making the story up. But there's a daydream aspect that, it, that all of us do in our ordinarily, ordinary lives. You daydream about your own life. What are you gonna do tomorrow? That guy you just met, you know, what if you call it, what's up? I say yes, no, you know, I mean, you start to get a daydream state. And stories are like that in a lot of ways for me, where I know it's not fixed, that I have to make it up but it's not so fixed as to not permit imagination and fantasy to, uh, to feed into the story. How do you create your title? Does it come first or after you finish? How do I create my titles? They're last, because I'm so bad at it. <laughs> I'm really, I, I, I'm usually desperate. Only twice have I had a title even midway into the book. One was the things they carried, because I, I recognized my own phrase as going beyond just war. It's for all of us, you know, I think you'd write the things they carried about your life or a stockbroker's life or a doctor's life. And it goes beyond soldiering. And, I, and it has to do with the, the burdens of life as they're delivered to us. Um, and what we all, carry through our lives and keep a, a, you know, piling on as you get older through life. The memories and the ghosts, the disappointments, 
to guilt, to all those things that pile on. And although they, they aren't tangible like this, they have a they have a certain specific gravity that you know presses on you. And then there's this one over here. Uh, the other one was a book called In the Lake of the Woods, which was, I think is my best book, probably by far my best book. Um, that book, that title came to me fairly, for some of the same reasons, came to me early on. But it's a struggle. I, only only reason I've really read the Bible in my life is just looking for titles. I, you know, <laughs> that's kind of what I use it for, more than religious stuff as a source. I have yet to find a good one because they're all taken up by other writers. <laughs> I was born too late. Um, two questions about the things they carried. Um, one, how long did that take you to write? And two, um, were the characters like any of your friends? How did you come up with the characters? Yeah, it took a long time. It took over five years. In fact, I probably took seven years. I began it abandoned it for a while because it was, I, I just didn't have a, have a, uh, I have to have a central grasp of what a book's doing. It's got to be something really simple to say about it or else I don't want to write it. And I didn't have, what, it was too complicated in my mind and it, it had to be simple and it, it wasn't. So I, I, I put it aside and began another book then put that aside and returned to the things they carried because it dawned on me that the centrality of the book. What, how I could think of it easily, and it was all one quick thought that went different, offered other thoughts and other dramatic possibilities, but it was one big central thing. Uh, and then the issue of the, the characters being friends, is that what you said? Yeah, were they like any of your friends? Or, I mean, they're just, there's such a wide variety and they're so complex. I, I really well, the characters become my friends more. I don't have many real friends, so they're, they're pretty much my real <laughs> friends. The, uh, when I walk out of here, I'm not going to, you know, much as I like you all, or at least I don't dislike you, <laughs> I'm not going to remember you. I mean, I'm just not going to do it. I don't even know your names. And you're going to be, you're going to instantly be eradicated from my memory as a, unless somebody does something really weird, then I'll remember. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> but it, you know what I mean. Whereas these characters, even though they aren't physically real, my dad's not physically real. Been dead for four or five years now, but he lives inside me, and I can just close my. I don't have to close my eyes, and he's throwing me a baseball, or mm -hmm. chastising me at dinner, or sitting reading that book I mentioned, and, a, and a many other memories as well. Um, physical reality is has what is one world, but another world is the world of memory and imagination. And that's where my characters live, and Jimmy Cross, and the little girl Linda, and Henry Dobbins with the pantyhose around his neck. All, and Jimmy Cross, and Martha, they're, they're all, as, they're like my dad. They're not physically present, but they have a, a, they have a presence that's undeniable. It's not like Alice in Wonderlandish or Hobbity. It's, it's as real as my dad. Or if maybe your ex-boyfriend, you know, from ten years ago or four years ago or three, who was not physically there, but has a reality. And uh, the characters in my books are never lifted out of life. I don't copy people's stuff, you know, their mannerisms and so on. I will. Um, the most I'll usually do is just borrow a, uh, I borrow a name here and there. That I'll. I like the sound of it, and that's what I mostly s steal from the from the real world, for the characters. The rest is almost entirely a product of my imagination. Um, in the things they carry and going after Kachado, uh, you like dabble with the truth, truth versus reality a lot. So, um, how much of the truth is uh, in your writing? Well, on one level, none of it's true, and on the other level, all of it's true. Uh, how do you how do you explain it? It's it's. I've been trying now ever since I wrote that book. I've been trying to explain what I mean by this, and I always think I've done it well, and then I get blank stares at me afterward after I think I've done a brilliant job. 
but I'll try again. I could say to you now that it's true that it's 20 after 3, and I'd be telling the truth. But it's not true in Tokyo, is it? <laughs> or on Neptune, is it? So what's true here doesn't have to be true there. There's a temporal element to what's true. Or I could take another cut at it. The words, I love you, can be spoken one day, and they'd be true. A year later, maybe not. Same words, same declaration of love, true in one circumstance. People fall out of love. And if you say, the, utter the words, I love you, one day, you may be telling the truth. And if you say the same words 10 years later, you may be lying. Ah, uh, truths can be contradictory. They can live so opposite declarations about the world can be, tr can be true, even though they're total opposites. I could say America is a great and good country, and I could talk for hours about our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution and the Marshall Plan. I could go on a long time. Or I could say to you, America is a country that once permitted slavery, and I'd be telling the truth. And a country of Jim Crow laws and robber barons and pinstripes and Hollywood blacklists and I, what we did to the American Indian and an event in Vietnam called My Lai. Well, both declarations are truth. And so that truth begins to get undermined. You get less certain about what's true. And then you get drafted and you're sent to Vietnam to a war you despise, and you're down in the slime at the bottom of an irrigation ditch and listening to people die all around you. People screaming, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. And your sense of truth gets undermined even more. You look at your hands, and am I really here in this war? And is this, what happened to that little boy that grew up in Worthington, Minnesota, and all the things I thought about him, oh, what a good guy he was. And, would never do anything nasty. And so, so there your sense of what's true gets undermined. And, and then you think back on that minister in the Methodist church in my hometown saying, thou shalt not kill. And then you end up in Nam, and you said, you'd better kill or we'll court-martial your ass. Who's telling the truth? What's true? So you see, I'm trying to use different levels of argument to, 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 explain partly why I did what I did in the book as to make to press the word true to press it um, so that you as a reader would feel a little bit off balance the way I did all those years ago and still do feel off balance in all kinds of ways I just I just skimmed I just skipped across the surface a little bit but I was trying to, that's that central thing I was talking about with the things they carried that I didn't have when I first started the book, that I knew I wanted to write a book, not about war and bombs and bullets, but I wanted to write a book about how, how, how the, the absolutist notion of truth, that kind of common sense notion we all go through life with, can be undermined by life itself. You can just pull it out from under you. That woman you were so much in love with, one night says, I've never loved you. I've, in fact, I've always kind of not liked you. And boom, there goes the rug that you had under you for all that, was all that time. Um, I, had that, I got a letter from a woman in Minneapolis, my home state, about, I think a year and a half ago or two years ago. And it was about the things they carried. She was a 26-year-old uh, uh, elementary school teacher. And what I just said was kind of what she said in her letter. She said, I, my family, my dad had been a Vietnam veteran and never talked about the war. And there was, I used to dread going to eat, eat dinner every day because the silences at the table were just crippling and horrendous. And my dad was tense and full of anger. And she said she grew up all through elementary, junior high school years feeling more like a counselor to her parents than like a daughter. And she said, uh, 
At one point, her mother took her aside and told her, I've never loved your father. And she said, what? And mother said, well, how could you? He doesn't, how can you love somebody that keeps all these secrets and doesn't talk about himself or the world? How can you love somebody? It's like you're trying to love a, a cipher. Um, then one day, she, this girl brought home the things they carried, and she was assigned an AP English and when she was a senior in high school. And it got them to talking and kind of opened things up. It didn't, and she ended her, her letter by saying, my, my mom and dad aren't perfect, but they're still together. And it, so this, 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 that's another angle of this truth thing that you, that you mentioned, a way of, uh, of talking about it. Is the truth isn't this solid, one-headed thing that we ordinarily think it is. It's fluid and it evolves. Ask Columbus. Ask Galileo. Ask Newton. Now ask Einstein with string theory. That what we think of as absolute truths, we're too confident about it. And we're sometimes too cocky about it. And sometimes we'll kill for it. Like Muhammad Atta when he flew those airplanes into the World Trade Center. But here, he not he didn't fly both, the one he flew. But he thought he knew an absolute and perfect truth, a truth worth dying for and killing for. The fanatic, self-righteous, zealous, uh, sanctimonious, holier than thou, black and white, I'm right and you're wrong declarations of what's true and what's not true and this that produced a Vietnam for me you know kind of wrecked my life that that absolutism and it can wreck lives in not just global ways political ways it can wreck them in any kind lots of ways it's a long answer to your question but it's, it's a pretty important question it's about that book anyway. I love the expression that I've heard you use of emotional truth, of conveying emotional truth. Yeah, there's, whether, a, yeah. there's a level of emotional yeah. truth to the world that we may not be able to articulate what we feel about things, even about other people, but the fact that language fails us doesn't mean there's some emotional, not some emotional thing happening in there that you just can't find, you can't attach language to it. Um, I was I thought it was interesting that you mentioned um, Joseph Heller is an author that sort of writes about war as well. Um, when I was reading some of your pieces, especially a segment from um, going after Kajiana, thank you, <laughs> hard word. <laughs> um, a lot of the a lot of the dialogue it wasn't the same, but it reminded me a lot of Joseph Heller's Catch Twenty Two. Is that did you read? I, I hadn't read the book then. No, I think it it has that book has more to do with what we both went through that we both, apparently, I've read the book since, we both felt caught up in a war that was went in loops. And you were a, a trap sensation that no matter what you did, you couldn't get out of it. You couldn't, and by it, I meant get out of the commission of sin and evil and horror and nastiness. You, there was no way out of it. And then the yawning death on top of it all. But I think the similarity has more to do with the, the experience of being ensnared or trapped in a, in a kind of, it felt like a machine had, I was inside of a washing machine and it was going like this, you know, and I was just inside the thing and couldn't find a way out of it the same way that with Catch-22, you know. You, you can't get out of flying unless you're crazy, but if you, but if you say you want to get out of flying, that means you're not crazy, so you can't get out of flying. So it's just a circle, you can't get out of it. So, And I, I felt the same sense of being ensnared. Yeah. I, I thought it was uh, really interesting when you were talking about the book, was it called uh, Before I Go to Sleep? The, the, the book that you read on the way here was it called Before I Go to Sleep. That was it, right? Um, you were saying how it was this, it had this great concept, and at the end of it, it was almost like the author um, 
kind of kind of lost confidence in the idea and went for a popcorn thriller type of thing. Mm -hmm. That's something that I know uh, trying to write that I, I have fear of, and that's something that I come across. Do you have any experiences with that kind of thing of not of having a vessel of a story and then not sure to go with that or to, to go with a you know something else for for you know that that kind of experience? Do you have any experience with it? I have had the experience, but I've had the, also the brains to throw it away. They didn't know that I'd gone that way and to recognize it and to feel there's a sense of failure you can feel right away and it's in your gut somewhere so not your gut in your chest right in this hollow part here and you feel failure the same way if you fart in public <laughs> you're embarrassed <laughs> and you feel something happening here or if you're you know you don't recognize somebody that you know that you should recognize you met them three years later this happens in here and I cast it aside um, I didn't mean to criticize that book. In fact, I meant the opposite. I meant to encourage you all to read the book because uh, it's up until the very end. And probably most of you are going to like the end, too, because it, it does have a kind of thriller aspect that it seems to appeal to a lot of people. Um, but uh, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have spent all that time and hard work that this author had spent developing a story that was gripping in its own right without any f reaching for the familiar. It's like going to a Walmart looking for the familiar conclusion as opposed to making up your own. But she's made up all the rest of the stuff, this author. Why would you go to the Walmart and buy your ending for a buck fifty? I don't understand that. <laughs> but it felt that way to me. And um, I don't know, it was still, I mean, it was, I wish I'd been her editor. I just wish I'd been able at least to get my two bits in and say, well, I'd rethink it. Um, that brings me, I guess, a good transition point um, about the editing process and what your interaction has been with the editing process. Are there times where you know things come back to you and you're like, they just basically rewrote <laughs> the entire story, or are you satisfied with it? Well, I, I haven't had an editor for a long time, including with the things they carried. I had a kind of editor. Uh, it was a, she was a woman who worked for my publisher, but she wasn't an editor. She was kind of a reader. and She, asked, she was urging me to take out some of the, none of the most well-known chapters of the book, saying I don't belong. And uh, Thank God I didn't listen. I mean, that, that they have... I'm not against listening to advice, but I'm also going to going to be faithful to what I, I mean why publish a book if you're not faithful to what you think is excellence and necessary so the two of the chapters and that he, anybody who's read the book are, they're all going to remember them because they're really good chapters and sort of the the book wouldn't be really good without those chapters and she wanted them lifted uh, pretty much wholesale and she had really bad breath. I remember, <laughs> I remember sitting across from her in some cafe, and God, from that far away, I had to kind of look the other way. And I'm a smoker, so if I think it's bad, it's got to be, I don't know what she ate. <laughs> but it wasn't. Um, I did have, early on in my career, I had a, a buddy, he was a friend of mine from the Army, who went on to teach high school English. And he, he guided me through uh, Cacciato with his advice. He didn't say, you know, take chapters out or do this, but he, he'd respond. He'd read it and respond by saying, I, things like I thought it was slow. And that's all I needed. I didn't know, need to hear where slow or just if somebody says, who's my friend, he has the, the, the courage to say, I think it's slow, I should pay attention. And I did, and it, it helped the book. You last two books kind of stray away from war stories. Was there any reason why you chose to do Tonka and Love and July, July in such a different um, way? Because I think of them as war stories, too. Or the other way around, I think of the other books as love stories. It, it's all one thing. that um, There's a point in the things they carried as an example. So when the, after the, uh, there's a chapter called How to Tell a True War Story. And it's, you know, it has this killing of the baby water buffalo in it, and, and uh, Kurt Lemon being blown into a tree. 
And at the end of the story, the narrator guy, with has my name, says it wasn't a war story. It was a love story. And by that I meant the rat's love for his friend, and his best friend has died, and you're worried about a dead buffalo when his best friend has been blown into a tree, and, <coughs> and it's directed at, at America, I guess, this kind of, this country that loves to have Ajax sprinkled on its wars and clean them all up and don't show me the gore and don't show me the not naughty language and you know they want to hear they want to hear characters say oh poop i've been shot and they always say, i just want to clean it all up and uh the narrator gets testy about, about that that take that poor dead baby water buffalo and in the way i guess sometimes i get I get testy when, uh, you know, that, that the same kind of thing. For me, Tomcat and love is, is not a, it's about the same thing I've always been writing about. It's a, it's a comedy, but it's still about the same thing, which is the human heart and the, the pressures that are applied to it. I was curious, um, I have a few questions. One is, um, as I said before, you have a reputation for being a wonderful teacher, and I was curious if there's advice you feel you wind up giving aspiring writers again and again, and if so, if you might be willing to give it to us. <laughs> and if not. Well, I'll give, me, I'll give it. I mean, you're not going to take it, but I'll give it. You, you, gotta, you have to have talent, I guess, but whatever that is, I have no idea what it is, but it has something to do with uh, reading a lot, and having, you know, hearing the music of how novels are written and poems are written. You, you hear, you hear the sound of good prose and different kinds of good prose and, and poetry. But that's, that's not sufficient. You, you have to take whatever music you hear and story you have to tell and you have to sit down at seven in the morning and stay sat down <laughs> until seven at night or whatever long it takes to do something worth the doing and then you got to do it the next day and then the next day and then the next day and you got to do it on your birthday and you got to do it on Halloween and on Christmas <laughs> and on New Year's you don't stop you don't say ah oh, I think I'll go bowling or somebody call <laughs> you up it is it's there's a regularity especially to what I do as a, as a novelist it's probably not as true for poets. I mean, I don't think it is true in the same way I mean it for poets. But for, for novelists, it, novels are like, as I mentioned a lot, you know, 20 minutes ago, they're like dreaming. And if you wake up from a dream and you go to the refrigerator and you get a glass of orange juice and you go back to bed, you can't, you can't rejoin the dream. You, you, you've awakened. Maybe now and then, like once a lifetime, we might re-enter a dream, or maybe even a couple of times, but by and large, it, it, you can't. And it's the same with writing a novel, that you, you, you leave it for a week, or even for me, a couple of days, and you remember the characters, and you can remember the story, the plot, but what you can't remember is the passion that brought you to want to do a do it all and work with it all. If something gets sapped, and something vital gets sapped, and so regularity, and I have yet to meet a novelist who wouldn't say this. I mean, I really have not ever met, except failed novelists, I've met a bunch of those who you know, say, I'll get to it on Thursday. But novelists who, who are committed to, to the form and to, to language and to you know, storytelling, understand that you, there's, there's an element of the donkey <coughs> in, in what, what we do. It's trudging along. In, in Vietnam, we called it humping. You just hump up the mountain, and you just kept humping. Despite the dangers and the risks and how terrified you were, you just kept humping. And there's an element of that to writing a novel that, that it's, it can be tedious and um, 
you know, cause hemorrhoids and all, do all kinds of things. But I think it's a, I think it's an essential <coughs> thing that has to do with that you, I, I, you, I could give the advice, but it'd be like be like advising you to on pole vaulting. <laughs> that you're probably not going to take the advice. You're probably not going to go out and learn to pole vault. <coughs> probably not. And on top of that, I don't think that for those who want to be novelists, really, they they would they I, they would need my advice because they would just kind of understand that's how you got to do it to make a novel. They're that thick or that thick, and you have to stay with it through through. Uh, it's not to the, to, the, to the duration. It's not very happy advice, but it's, it's true, I think, as much as I know what true is. I think it's inspiring. <laughs> when you mentioned talent, it seemed sort of like this inexplicable thing to you. Do you think the being able to put up with, being able to keep humping every day, do you think that's part of it? Just you're born with it or you're not? Do you think it's yeah. a learned thing? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that I'm... I and the other people I know who are, who I know, you know, intimately, who are novelists, they're much like me. They're they're stubborn and tenacious, maybe to a fault. Um, there's a t tenacity that goes with writing a, a novel <coughs> that I don't think you learn. I don't I don't know. Or if you do, maybe you learn it way back and. Childhood somewhere or through junior high, maybe there you, maybe there it's picked up. I'm not, I don't know anything about the genetic code and whether it's in there or not, and I don't think even geneticists do yet. They may well one day, so it's no doubt. I would guess it's a mixture of something in the genes, but it has to do with background and the, the ambition, striving for. I don't mean fame. I mean ambition to write something worth the reading. Uh, that's that's part of it, and then it, there's also the the uh, element of of just my sheer love of story. The more rich the story, and the more complicated the story, the, 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 in terms of layering of it, I like the central part simple, and easy to articulate. But I love layering of stories. I, I love stories, and to tell a good one, I got to sit there for a long time. Well, I think I've done lots of times, and it turns out I'm wrong. That uh, the things they carry is a good example. That there, there are now I don't know four editions, all of which are different, of a book that I mean that was a really successful book, you know. And yet I still, about a year ago, made pretty substantial changes in it that you probably aren't going to notice as a just a general reader. Um, but if you're like you guys and want to be writers, you're going to notice the mistakes I've made in earlier editions. I, for example, I overused the word weird, just a, a little word. You have to bear, bear in mind that like five years of six years of writing this and chapter one is like two years in the past. And then you use the word weird again and then another year goes by, use it again, then six months go by and there it is. And so by the time the book was published, it had like 12 weirds, that, that word in it, or maybe more. Um, and I, I hadn't read the book in its entirety in a long time and did for this. There's an edition called, this the 20th anniversary edition. I got a new hardcover came out. And I read it and noticed this and made, that's just one thing of many that I changed. There, there's, there, a lot of it was deleting ugliness. It was not like, rewriting anything. It was just get rid of an ugly clause or a, a phrase that struck me as as, as a Walmarty, that thing I mentioned earlier, or just but ugly, period. Um, and it's a better book. So will it, is it finished? I don't know. It seems that way, but maybe not. There's, there's, a, there's an ear thing that goes with writing, I think, that it's like music, you know, you hear a song and it comes to this conclusion and it just feels concluded that any more notes would be superfluous and 
and or else would or else would not superfluous, but would just mess it up. And you dispense with them, and there's a conclude there's a concluding sound. There would be with a with a you know the score of a symphony or a pop song that it feels over. And it's a it's a hearing thing. And I think that one of the things that to, with guy, people like you I would want to leave behind would be the, to, to learn to trust, it's a hard thing to do, but to trust your sense of sound in your prose. When you're writing stiffly and badly for class and you're doing a short story, you're sometimes being faithful to what you think is the teacher or the, some expectation of it's a wooden, stiff feeling. And when you're yourself, you're letting that sense of your own, the sound of your own voice enter the story. And it may not be this voice that you use in the regular world. It's your best voice. It's that voice that you'd shout to God with or to your boyfriend or girlfriend or your mom or dad, your best voice where you'd declare something about yourself in your words and with your passion not that other self that we all sort of use to comport ourselves through the lives we lead, but that voice that's yours. And you know it when you say it. I can hear it in my own voice now. Like, I know what I'm saying is true. I know this is Tim O'Brien. And there are other times that I'm talking to you and I feel like I'm not quite there, quite there. And to be faithful to that. And that voice will conclude itself for you. It'll, you'll hear that you'll hear it end and you know that, that that's over at least that chapter um, I had a question about uh, the things they carry the chapter the sweetheart of song Trabada that was one of my favorite chapters thank you and it what really stood out to me about it was it was so different from the other chapters it was almost like it was kind of almost random but it mm -hmm. wasn't so yeah. what was your thought process in having that chapter there there were a whole bunch of things that went into putting Sweetheart of the Song Trabong in. And there's so many it's going to sound mechanical to you, and it, I don't mean it to sound that way. I basically put it in because I like the story. That's, I just thought this story belongs in here. Why? Well, there's Rat Kiley telling it. Rat Kiley tells the story of Marianne Bell the way I'm telling the story in general for the whole book. So it's, it's a, like it's an imitative of, of the process that I'm using myself to write the book, only Rat's doing it. So a character in the book is doing what I'm doing as the author of the book, trying to convince you that this, is, this happened. This happened. As weird as it sounds, woman in combat, and he gets pissed off that they know his fellow soldiers don't believe him. He said, how can you not believe this? You've seen weirder stuff in Vietnam, lots weirder. The only reason you don't believe it is it's a woman. That's it, gender, pure and, pure and simple. Otherwise, you'd believe it. Because look at yourself. Look how old you are. You're fresh out of high school. You came over here with naive ideas and romantic notions of the world. And look what happened to you. Why can't it happen to a woman? That's rap telling the story. Hopefully, I'm telling it for rap, kind of. So that's one reason to kind of to make the form of the book, that, is the, that structure of the book, be in the book. Rat telling that story. Then there's another notion of kind of what Rat said I found, I found convincing. I'm writing it, so I guess I would. But, I, <laughs> but why, why wouldn't you believe that story? Because logistically, if you're a fresh out of high school and you're a woman back then, you can get on an airplane. Nobody's going to say you can't get on an airplane. And you can fly to LA, and then you can buy an airline ticket and fly to Bangkok. You can buy another ticket and fly to Saigon, and nobody's going to stop you. So logistically, it's t totally credible. It's, in fact, it's mundane. It's, tr it's trivial. You just buy airline tickets. <laughs> and then you arrive in Vietnam, and you're this good-looking cheerleader. you got 500,000 guys. We'll take any place else you want to go. All you got to do is say, here I am and uh, you're gone. You'll be wherever you want to go. So there's nothing in the story that's like, like you know, Thumbelina or Hansel and Gretelish. It's, it's just, it's the, it was the world. And then I thought, started thinking, well, there were women in Vietnam. And I started thinking about that. There are journalists and good ones, Frankie Fitzgerald and Gloria Emerson. 
There were nurses, there were secretaries working for contractors, there were hippies that just thumbing their way up Highway 1. Um, there, there's a statue to them in, on the mall in Washington. It's not as if Vietnam were like empty of women. So all these things Rat is using to try to convince them that this woman had actually been there. And I began to feel like Rat a little bit as there's more and more I wrote the story that I could feel the, the realistic world pressing in on me, saying, this couldn't have happened, this couldn't have, and I'm trying to fight back against it, and saying, are you crazy? Of course it could happen. You're letting gender get in the way of the obvious, that, you know, but then I start talking to myself as I wrote the story, as Rat would later tell the story about, well, what I don't believe is that a woman could end up doing what this guy did. He, she couldn't end up a killer. She couldn't end up, like, liking combat. That couldn't happen to a woman. That's, and Rat's saying, are you, are you nuts? Of course, I mean, what about Lizzie Borden? That should she, did she take an ax? What, what about, you know, and then go through all the queens of England and of Russia. I mean, there were half my girlfriends in my life. You don't want to meet them in dark alleys. <laughs> it's not as if, like, men are, you know, uh, you know, like macho killers and women are like the nurturers. It's not, if it were that simple, what a world we'd have. At least we'd understand it. But it's not that simple, as we all know. And Rat is trying to say all this. All these forces are going into a book that at the center of which is this notion of truth. And one of the things that can get in the way of our looking fairly and justly at the world and truthfully or honestly at the world are all the conventions we bring to it, among them the conventions of gender. And I wanted to address that in the book. That's why it's a, it's a that's, there, there's more I could say about why it's in there as well. But you get, that gives you an idea of how uh, the role I felt it fit, it, it fits within the overall structure of the book. I'm leaving out other things that I think are important about the story, but I'll, I can, I'll mention them some other time. Um, so what are the most important things you carry now with you? Most important things I carry? Well, guilt. Uh, I shouldn't have gone to Vietnam. And the force that made me go, which was pretty simple, it was like fear of, fear of embarrassment or humiliation. I didn't want people to think of me as a coward, so I went. I still have trouble with, not with war stuff, but I have it in just daily life. I'm, I have a hard time uh, saying no to, to things that I don't, want to do, you know, and sort of standing up for myself. For the same reason, I want to be nice to people, like nice to my country, so I'll go kill for you, and I want to be nice to people, yeah, I'll read your shitty book, and, <laughs> and, and I do it, everything, every corpuscle in me says, I just know, I mean, you can't even talk in decent sentences, I know you can't write, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> And a million things like it. I don't mean just books, but a million things like it. Uh, that's what I meant earlier by saying it's not Vietnam for it for me is at the heart of the book because it really isn't. It's it's uh, almost everything but Vietnam that that that, that, that led to the, the, the Vietnam being at the uh, center of my life. The, the inability to say no, being among those things. Uh, what else do I carry? Um, well, I, ca I carry, you won't believe this because I've been talking for an hour in here, but I carry <laughs> silence with me because I don't, I don't do this sort of talk unless I'm, you know, <coughs> expected to do it. But I don't, you know, walk around my hotel here in New Brunswick talking about Vietnam or <laughs> stories. Or, I mean, I'm silent. And, and, um, and then, you know, I'm thinking of a book I'm working on and so on, so I'm carrying that book with me. I'm also carrying now my age in a way that I don't think I carried it when I was younger, that inside I feel much like I did when I was 21 or 22 with the same values and the same yearnings and all the rest, but the, the, the mirror betrays that, and I can feel it clock ticking now that I didn't 
feel, except in Vietnam, when I then I didn't feel like kind of a clock going, maybe the next minute, maybe the next minute, where uh, the, the urge to do something meaningful, to maybe write one more really good book, is, uh, is doubled or tripled, compounded <coughs> for sure. And I'm carrying, I'm carrying that with me. Which we, of course, we all carry, but it's it's um, part of what I carry. There's other stuff too. I carry people with me. That I just this afternoon reading that book and then finding the acknowledgement to somebody whom I know so well, as I know this woman married to this guy who's lost his memory. Really, I mean, just hit me like a sledgehammer. That there's a real person that I've really known in the world who is living the book I just read. That's pretty weird. Somebody's living it. Living with somebody you can't remember every day they wake up. I'm married to you, I'm married to you, I have no idea. And have to relearn it every day, then go to sleep and forget it. Boy, that's, so that was a sledgehammer feel. Shows you how good the book was. Yes? Um, are there any instances when you're writing where you just don't know what to do now? Yeah, pretty much all the time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's what it is. I sit there like the donkey I am, trying out sentences. She, you know, didn't even have the character do something. You try to write it convincingly and gracefully. That's a little edge to the sentence, so you believe the sentence. And then you try to, if it if it seems like the right thing, then that sentence is done for now, and you do the next sentence. If it's not the right sentence, you try another sentence. Uh, she, you know, I don't know, whatever the next sentence is going to be, just do different things until, oh, that's... An example I can give you from the things they carried is there's a bit of dialogue at the end of, uh, near, the, uh, near the end of that baby buffalo section, where uh, the, the buffalo is now dead, and Rat Kiley has gone off to kind of cry and get himself together. And the other guys are sitting around looking at the buffalo and they finally pick it up and they dump it in a village well. And then this, this character named Mitchell Sanders says, there's, a, there's another character who says, man, I've never seen anything like it. My whole life, he's, I'm talking his language, like that's why the grammatical error, but I've never seen anything like it. Never, my whole life, never seen anything like it. And the other character says, Mitchell Sanders says, well, that's nom for you. Garden of Evil. Over here, man, every sin's real fresh and original. Well, I can't tell you how long I worked in that dialogue. I worked on it and worked on it. I knew there had to be some bit of dialogue that, that punched it or accented it. But, it but, but, oh, I don't know, a week and a half, three weeks, a long, long time. Until the line, every, every, over here, man, every sin's real fresh and original. Which is how, to me, it means that a sin might have been committed a kabillion times in world history. But when you do it, it's fresh. It's original. But you did it. It's your sin. It's not Adam and Eve's. It's not, you know, Ahab's. It's yours. It's fresh and original. And that's what, that, that's what uh, that line means to me. Well, I wasn't looking for the meaning. I didn't even know I wanted to say that until the words did it for me. That meant writing sentences and then trying this bit of dialogue and then throwing it away and trying again and again with every line. Um, for you, what's the lesson? The lesson is pay attention to every sentence. Try to give it, try to give it edge, and if it doesn't doesn't work, throw it away and do another one until it, you will write something. Because we, if I would, if you if you try hard enough, I think that'll it'll strike you as surprising that your own sentence will surprise you, and you'll have written something you didn't know you knew or didn't know entirely, or only partly knew, or partly even suspected you knew, but it'll strike you with a force that. That's uh, so. That was worth the sitting there for those couple of hours to get that one bit of dialogue or that that bit of description that is 
new to the world and, and uh, good. You still write on a typewriter? Sometimes I do. I've got an old Royal that I bat at sometimes. It's a great big clunky, you know, yeah. great big <laughs> thing, and it's hard to find ribbons now. But you can. But I, I still I largely write in on uh, you know my computer. I think we're out of time. This has been so wonderful and so important for all of us to be here with you. Yeah. Thank you so so Thanks much.